Welcome to Thomas Houston's webcast summarizing the important topics presented at the 2020 National Industry Liaison Group Virtual Conference. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the in-person conference was canceled and the NILG has offered more than 25 webinar programs to be presented between July 6th through September 1st. Thomas Houston had the pleasure of attending these programs and is presenting the summaries of these programs in two separate webcasts, one for July sessions and one for August and September sessions. This program will cover the August and September sessions. As a consultancy that specializes in affirmative action and equal employment opportunity, Thomas Houston attended these sessions that were directly related to our main line of business, affirmative action compliance. As such, as we move through this presentation, you will notice that the focus on many of the attended sessions was compliance evaluations, including focused reviews, individuals with disabilities, Section 503, VEVRA, veterans, and equal employment opportunity. We will begin by reviewing and highlighting the various sessions as related to affirmative action compliance. We will explain how the OFCCP and the NILG are collaborating to assist the federal contracting community. We will then review the sessions on disability inclusion, strategic diversity, OFCCP enforcement, compensation under the functional AAP or FAP programs, and the EEOC programs. The National Industry Liaison Group's mission is to further equal access and non-discrimination by partnering with agencies, practitioners, and consultants to the contractor community. The NILG supports local ILGs and produces the annual conference with national and local input. The NILG has continued its OFCCP partnership under a Memorandum of Understanding and is continuing the compensation roundtable with them. In the affirmative action world, there are more than just the three OFCCP governing regulations that dictate employer compliance. HR professionals are also dealing with FLSA and ADA issues, as well as FMLA, NLRB, and religious freedom topics. Sometime, even determining who is an employee can result in legal wrangling. Observations were made, mentioning that there will be many cases stemming from intersections of different regulations, sex plus age, race plus ADA, etc., with the pandemic adding new interactions. The advice to HR professionals was to keep lines of communication open, don't dismiss questions or requests out of hand, but instead engage in a dialogue that can hopefully lead to a mutually amicable resolution. There are over 60 million individuals with some type of disability, and most are non-visual. Although the revised Section 503 regulations have established a 7% utilization goal, only 13% of all contractors have achieved this goal. There continues to be a wide wage gap for individuals with disabilities. In order to have a truly inclusive workforce, you must start at the top. This includes full support that affects both the company's climate and culture and is built on a foundation of trust and inclusion. A company should develop a strategy and set metrics that can be measured. This plan includes an evaluation of your current workforce by looking at where you are and where you want to be. Attention should also be directed to unintended barriers such as technology, the application process, and a review of policies and practices to ensure they are effective. Best practices include a centralized accommodation process, appropriate management training, as well as increased training and mentoring for individuals with disabilities. The company's disability outreach program must be evaluated to ensure they are reaching qualified individuals with disabilities, including partnerships with schools, and their on-campus disability offices. A self-identification process must ensure there are no negative repercussions for self-identification. The OFCCP continues to conduct the Section 503 focused reviews, including a virtual on-site and interviews. 
A company's culture should be a part of and match any diversity and inclusion program. This program must be measurable. The metrics should include several factors, such as demographics in the workforce, recruiting outcomes, employee retention, compensation, promotion and selection process, as well as the external recruiting area based on census data. The diversity and inclusion program should foster innovation and collaboration, as well as identify areas of improvement. Therefore, you must be able to design, measure, assess, and report. It should be integrated as part of various areas of the organization, including learning and development, talent acquisition and recruiting. This clear plan of action must be disseminated throughout the company, especially to top management. The challenges on a successful DNI program include the lack of support, especially top-down support, the ability to measure, and the budget to accomplish the established goals and objectives. Job interviews come in all shapes and sizes, phone, in-person, group, behavioral, video, and more. The basics of interviewing are still the same. Decision makers should be trained to not make snap decisions based on appearance and unconscious biases. With video interviews, the interviewer should not base judgments on the background of the shot or poor connections. Judgments should also not be made based on irrelevant, non-job related information. Many companies are now using biometrics as part of interviews and employment, including information such as fingerprints, voice prints, or retina scans. It is important to research and abide by ever-changing state and national laws. Before embarking on this technology, it is recommended to develop a written policy, probably with legal involved, and develop systems that ensure confidentiality and privacy of information. Ensure that the algorithms used to evaluate data are fair and unbiased. A validation study is recommended. A number of best practices are recommended such as adding a how-to prepare for your interview guide on the website, educating yourself and your team on laws regarding recording interviews and biometrics, and by providing training for managers and recruiters. The OFCCP has been very active this fiscal year, which began on October 1st of 2019. So far, there have been a total of 24 financial settlements, including $10 million for hiring and $6 million for compensation. In addition, there have been 54 non-financial settlements for technical violations, which include outreach and recruitment, record keeping, and job service listings. The Early Resolution Conciliation Agreement, also known as IRCA, has been successful in resolving cases more quickly. As of mid-August, a total of 21 IRCA settlements have been signed, affecting 416,000 employees and includes almost $4 million in back pay and an additional $5 million in salary adjustments over the next five years. An IRCA may provide the contractor fewer reviews over the next five years, help manage the company's resources, and fix problem areas identified on a wider company-wide basis. The Pre-Referral Mediation Directive, issued in April of 2020, provides guidance on specific instances where the OFCCP can look to refer cases to mediation. This median process provides an opportunity for both the OFCCP and the contractor to work out their differences with the help of a neutral mediator. This has proven to be successful since all 13 cases that were referred to mediation have been successfully resolved. The OFCCP is also trying to reduce the amount of time it takes to close a compliance review. In 2018, the average time was 516 days. In 2019, that time was reduced to 399 days. And for the first quarter of 2020, the average desk audit took just 35 days. The OFCCP will continue to conduct Section 503 focus reviews as well as the new VEVRA focused reviews for which scheduling letters have begun to be sent out. 
The OFCCP is also going to conduct additional focused reviews for accommodations for both disability and religious, as well as promotion focused reviews. To get specific details on OFCCP enforcement, go to enforcedata.dol.gov. The Corporate Scheduling Announcement List, or CSAL, provides contractors a minimum 45-day courtesy notification before the OFCCP begins sending its scheduling letter. Contractors can take advantage of this notification using the time provided to make sure they have their AEP prepared for submission. The OFCCP is still working through the 2019 list, including the supplemental list for VEVRA-focused reviews. If your company has one or more establishments on the list, there are a number of ways to prepare. First, review the list to determine what kind of review is planned. An establishment review, a compliance check, a focused review, or a corporate management compliance evaluation. Second, use a checklist based on the itemized listing to make sure you have everything needed. Third, get support from top-level management and use counsel for the preparation. Finally, develop teams to be involved in different areas and coordinate with other locations on the CSAL list. When looking at the Affirmative Action Plan analyses and results, ensure job groups are determined based on similarly situated employees. If impact ratio analyses yield areas of concern, research and be prepared to answer questions. The same holds true with compensation. Do the research in advance so you have answers for any areas of concern. The OFCCP will be looking closely at outreach and good faith efforts, so be sure you have all of that information prepared and ready to share. Be thinking ahead about all of the different questions that will be asked regarding record keeping, posters, policies, etc. Since the OFCCP has given you the heads up regarding an upcoming review, use the time wisely to prepare. The new CSAL of 2,250 service and supply establishments and the new CSAL of 200 construction contractors was recently released on the OFCCP website on September 11th of 2020. This list includes the various types of compliance reviews, such as the Corporate Management Compliance Evaluation, or CMCE, a review focusing on the headquarters establishment, the Establishment Review, Section 503 Focused Review, as well as the new Promotion Focused Review and the Accommodation Focused Review and the Compliance Check. There were no VEVRA Focused Reviews identified on this recent CSAL list. Based on the number of attendees quoted by the presenter, the session on the basics of AAP construction was one of the most widely attended sessions of the conference. A lot of people are looking to educate themselves on creating an accurate Affirmative Action Plan, or AAP, that can be implemented as part of the overall Affirmative Action Program. The AAP should be a business plan like any other. Establish a baseline, measure, create a plan to address areas in need, implement the plan, then see if it worked. The AAP itself contains multiple required analyses one by department, the remainder that look at job groups from different angles. It is important, as was repeated in almost every session of the conference, that job group development should be done strategically, combining similarly situated employees. Once those job groups are developed, availabilities of females and minorities for those job groups must be determined. There are a number of steps involved when looking at external factors, such as defining recruiting areas, assigning census occupation codes to titles, and weighting census codes based on representation. Internal factors, consisting of identifying and quantifying feeder jobs, must also be reviewed. A final step of determining the weight given to each of these factors allows for the calculation of the job group availabilities. Goals are set when comparing these availabilities to incumbency. The contractor can then conduct an analysis of personnel transactions to identify how they arrived at their current workforce representation and to identify any disparate impact. 
This yields additional areas to research to identify and remedy the root causes behind the adverse impact. The final advice from this session is important. Make sure to read and understand your affirmative action plans, especially the analyses and results. Ask questions, anticipate next steps. The Office of the Solicitor is an independent agency from the OFCCP. They provide legal services to various agencies, including litigation, advice, and rulemaking. They support 10 divisions and agencies, such as the OFCCP, OSHA, and Wage and Hour. Their recent directives include Directive 2020-01 for Spouses of Protected Veterans, Directive 2020-02 for Efficiency and Compliance Evaluations, Directive 2020-03 for Pre-Referral Mediation Program, and Directive 2020-04 for the Ombud Service Supplement. The Solicitor's Office also provides guidance on the focused reviews as well as opinion letters. They are involved in the Federal Contractor Compliance Manual, known as the FCCM, as well as cases between a company and the Administrative Law Judge, or ALJ, as well as the Office of Administrative Law Judges, or OALJ. These cases include a $6.6 million settlement for Black African Americans who were discriminated against in the company's management trainee program over a 10-year period. Another case involves systemic hiring discrimination against white, African-American, Asian, and American Indian Native American laborers in favor of Hispanic laborers. The settlement award included $780,998 in back pay and interest to the non-hired workers. This same contractor also provided $179,000 in back pay and interest for systemic compensation discrimination in hours assigned and compensation rates to female laborers based on their gender and African-American and white laborers based on their race and national origin. The OFCCP is placing a lot of emphasis on functional AAPs or FAPs and is encouraging contractors to consider moving to the strategy when designing their AAPs. The pros and cons of FAPs have been discussed throughout the conference. This session centered more on compensation considerations for FAPs. There are a number of advantages, such as accountability, alignment of business practices, more stability during the pandemic with increased numbers of teleworkers, and better statistical coverage. When creating AAPs based on functional lines of business, the contractor must still do an analysis of compensation and must control for differences that appear due to the span of the line of business within the company. Cost of living and labor, differing minimum wages and other characteristics can all come into play. Compa ratios, or the comparison ratio of the salary to the market midpoint, can be useful in navigating these differences. The EEOC, like many employers, is working remotely during the pandemic. Their website has been redone to include more frequently asked questions, or FAQs, as well as information on the COVID virus. Although the EOC has had fewer charge filings, they have recovered more in monetary resolutions. In fiscal year 2005, there were 300 and 81 suits and only 144 in fiscal year 2019. However, the monetary settlements increased from 354 million to 385 million. The majority of cases, 53.8%, were for retaliation. This is the highest percentage in the last 10 years. Individuals with disabilities accounted for 33.4%, Race accounted for 33%, sex accounted for 32.4%, and age accounted for 21.4% of the cases. These recent lawsuits included testing discrimination against female applicants, lack of reasonable accommodations, and harassment, unequal pay, denial of promotion, and harassment. Title VII now covers LGBTQ, 
including gender identity and sexual orientation. The EEOC can provide Respectful Workplaces training, which is an interactive skills-based training program, and your local office can be contacted for more information. A task force conducted a study on harassment in the workplace, and the results are available on the EEOC website. The EEO1 Component 2 report had a high compliance rate. On July 16, 2020, the Commission authorized a statistical study of the Component 2 data by the Committee on National Statistics. It will take one to one and a half years to complete to compare the usefulness of the information with the burden of collection. Several procedures and regulations, such as time limits for filing a civil action, procedures for complaints and regulations regarding wellness programs, will be revised and or updated. EEOC Commissioner Lipnick also noted the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 18th of 2020, as it gave women the right to vote. Another session addressed artificial intelligence and recruiting technologies. As everyone knows, artificial intelligence is basically the science of building smart machines to perform functions typically requiring human intelligence. Advancements in this area of computer science are creating paradigm shifts in every sector of the tech industry. As it relates to employment and selection, more automation is being introduced into the selection processes, such as games, challenges, questions, etc., with built-in algorithms used to automate selection of individuals. This session focused on areas to keep in mind as organizations continue to evolve in their use of artificial intelligence technology in selection. One area noted as important is validation where AI is used in a selection process. Evaluation of validity most commonly fit into one of the following, content, criterion related, or construct validation. Where adverse impact in the selection process occurs and AI technology is used, validation based on one of the above methods will be required to confirm the applicability of the process. Another area of concern had to do with risk exposure. As duly noted, the majority of software firms creating AI technology for recruiting have no vested interest in compliance and even oftentimes have disclosure statements that indicate their products may not be compliant. Therefore, contractors must be sure to fully investigate when investing in AI platforms. Emphasis was made regarding assessing the potential AI risk factors and tolerance of such for the organization appropriateness of testing and ensuring validation with applicable methods, vendor data privacy safeguards, transparency and accountability, ensuring vendor compliance with regulation requirements, and providing for agreements that include indemnification clauses as safeguards should claims arise. Overall, it is an area that presents exciting opportunities and challenges for contractors to navigate as AI recruitment technology continues to progress. The Employer Assistance and Resource Network, known as EARN, is the Technical Assistance Center for ODEP, or the Office of Disability Employment Policy. The Inclusion at Work framework includes Lead the Way by developing an inclusive culture such as affinity groups and having top-down support. The organization should educate, equip, and empower their employees. Build the pipeline through outreach and good faith efforts. By building relationships and partnerships, the organization can develop a pipeline of qualified candidates at all levels. Hire and keep the best by ensuring access to all aspects of the hiring process as well as career development opportunities. Ensure productivity by providing reasonable accommodations. The Job Accommodations Network, or JAN, provides a library of requests and solutions and can also be contacted for specific questions as well as a number of toolkits. Communication, both internal and external, including the intranet, newsletters, brochures, meetings, films, and employee meetings. Be tech savvy 
by evaluation of your organization's online application system and process, as well as communication systems. Measure success by evaluating individuals with disabilities representation, self-identification response, and outreach efforts. There is a difference between self-identification, which is used to measure an organization's progress toward the 7% utilization goal, as compared to self-disclosure, where an employee may request an accommodation and feels empowered to discuss their disability. The summary session of the 2020 NILG Virtual Conference started with the encouragement for contractors to take advantage of the vast number of jobs available due to the pandemic and to use this unprecedented opportunity to fill those jobs with females, minorities, veterans, and individuals with disabilities. The OFCCP is shrinking in terms of personnel and offices with less than 50% of their former number of employees and down from 78 to 55 offices. The OFCCP is evolving as they no longer perform automatic on-site visits as part of compliance reviews, so audits don't need to be done by a specific district, and they have closed some of their expensive offices due to the pandemic. In addition, the OFCCP is evolving as they now have a centralized branch of expert services for discrimination analyses and offer mediation services. The topic of similarly situated employees continues to be a main focus for the OFCCP and contractors, and the recommendation was made for a lawyer to define similarly situated employees and to drive the process of sorting and analyzing those groups. For affirmative action to be truly affirmative and to move toward diversity and inclusion within a company, management should use an effectiveness standard rather than good faith efforts. A contractor should ask, is what we're doing actually working? In regards to bias, there is both implicit and explicit bias. We must challenge ourselves to be thoughtful about how we see ourselves, other people, and the world. We cannot see what we have not been exposed to. Our life's journey informs the way we see the world and our job, including gender, age, race, and geographic area. We must identify who we are, how we see ourselves, as well as how others see us. An organization should have an inclusive culture and safe climate. This includes leadership that sets the example and listens to voices at all levels. You should analyze systems and procedures and redistribute resources to provide opportunities at all levels. The focus should be on objectivity over subjectivity and evaluate the facts rather than opinions. An organization must review and analyze the patterns of behavior. Employees don't leave a company, they leave bosses and teams and their behaviors. Employees need to feel that they belong. So ask a lot of questions on how employees think, feel, and what they want to see within the organization. Allyship, which is the practice of emphasizing social justice, inclusion, and human rights by members of an in-group to advance the interests of an oppressed or marginalized out-group, is about sharing an action and becoming an ally in networking, information, resources, and opportunities. Thomas Houston's team has enjoyed attending this year's NILG virtual conference and sharing the highlights with you. We hope you will be able to utilize this information in your ongoing affirmative action compliance efforts. The information provided in this webcast has been gathered from the various presentations of the 2020 NILG Virtual Conference during the months of August and September. You can follow Thomas Houston on our social media sites listed below. To receive further information on any of the topics included in this webcast or regarding our affirmative action, compliance evaluation, and AAEEO HR consulting services, contact our sales and marketing department by calling 1-800-330-9000, extension 110, or send a request via email to info at thomashouston.com. Thank you for your time and interest in today's webcast.